And welcome to Real Ag Live, everybody. It is the midweek edition of the show. It is Wednesday today. Thanks a lot for joining us. We are broadcasting today on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Thanks a lot for joining us. We're going to have a bit of a, well, a corn and soybean agronomic flair. So for those of you in eastern Canada or uh, the prairies, there is uh, stuff here definitely that applies to you as we are into the fields. We've warmed up. We're kind of past some of that cold weather in a good part of the country which feels uh, really good, I think. we're uh, it, it's, it's very, very welcomed, and the crop says thank you as well. Uh, what you can do is you can ask questions today. We are taking Q&A live on the fly here, so you can get your questions in by entering your question in the chat box, no matter where you're watching, on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. Let's get uh, today's guest in here. Uh, I want to introduce to everybody Neil McGregor. He is with Pride Seeds. He's their market development agronomist. Neil, how's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. Hey, it's great to chat with you. Okay, Neil, what do you do at Pride? Uh, so I cover uh, essentially all the agronomy aspect, product positioning, uh, cover our dealer network and growers, uh, essentially Kingston east to the Quebec border. So, so any, any uh, product info, training, um, field calls, anything like that, that's, uh, that's really my aspect. Now, Eastern Ontario is taking this warming up seriously. We're above 30 degrees today in Ottawa. Yeah, uh, actually, my, my thermometer says 33, and uh, check the Humidex, and it's supposed to be over 40, so, so it's a 40. nice warm day today. 40. Oh, that, okay, that, that, that's, that's taking it seriously, man. That's, uh, that's definitely uh, going to put a sweat on a lot of people that are out there doing some physical labor. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we've seen so far. How, how are the crops making out in eastern Ontario? Uh, actually fairly well. Um, we're in a really good position here in Eastern Ontario. Um, corn, I would be pretty comfortable to say 99% of the corn is, is planted and a lot of that's actually up out of the ground now. Mm -hmm. Uh, soybeans, I'd probably say we're about the 75% mark, maybe even a little higher. And some of them are actually poking up. Cotyledons are starting to poke out of the ground there. So, so things are looking good. Uh, spotty rains, but we could, uh, we could use some rain in some spots, but, uh, other spots have been lucky to get some of those rains. What are you hearing from some of your colleagues at Pride about other parts of the country or like other parts of Ontario? Oh, uh, I, I know for sure. Southwestern Ontario, uh, they had, they had a good three inch rain a little over a week ago and, uh, they've been slow going and especially some of those spots with the tough clays like Essex and Lambton and, uh, hauled them in there. They, uh, they've had some challenges for sure. I think they're going now and, and having some better luck right now. Okay. Can we finally put some of this temperature factor to rest then now that we've warmed up so much? Um, I think so. I think uh, even some of that early planted uh, corn and even some soybeans, uh, they, they struggled to get out of the ground. Uh, they took a long time. Um, that, early, that early cooling uh, really impacted some germination potentially. Definitely not to the most part the extent of damage, but, uh, but definitely slowing things down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, I got a question here from uh, Real Ag's Burn Tobin. Um, Burn says, when considering corn replants, is it important to know whether you planted a flex or a fixed hybrid? Um, not particularly. Unless you're planning to keep what's still there, um, then you can kind of range your population. But more so if you're planning on terminating the existing crop there, um, that is not a huge aspect. It, if you're going to keep it and it's a low population, you can definitely, that flex, having a flex hybrid really impacts that because you can push with some extra nitrogen and, and that fungicide timing to really to really flex out that year. Are, are you hearing about any replanting out there? Uh, just a little bit. Not, not a huge amount, uh, just very minimal scale. It seems to be early planting, um, more so hybrid, hybrid specific. Uh, some of those slower mergers, that are typically a slow merger uh, in some of those tougher, heavy soils. The light soils seem to get away very well with those early planting, but some of those tougher soils, uh, those clays hardened up a bit and just emergence was a challenge. Okay, so with, with any decision, we kind of have thresholds, right? And so how, how do you evaluate that replanting decision? If somebody feels like they're close, where do you, how do they establish that kind of bar to know if they're you know under or above? And if they're above, then maybe they got to think about a replant. What does that threshold decision look like? Um, I'd really say anything in that low 
low to mid 20,000, anything below there, you need to start thinking about it. Um, because you really need to assess the fact of, uh, the heat, the heat units you've accum accumulated and what that's, you already have that, but if you replant, you lose what you've already gained and what's your yield potential, potential going to be with potentially a lower heat unit hybrid. And I, I would imagine in, in like in history, one of our parts of this decision would be the, the date, right? And the fact yeah. that, you know, we get too far into the season, we're, we're losing yield based on when we're doing that replant. Although, to be honest, probably last year taught us that we can get, a, if weather cooperates, we could get away with a little bit of a later planting date on a replant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, still, uh, it's, it's really tough to know because even, even in, uh, in uh, the Ottawa Valley, we, we did have some, some test weight and moisture issues that we ran into. We didn't, we didn't get graced with all the heat like they did in the southwest. Um, but uh, definitely some of those June plantings really, really were impacted by, uh, by some of those low test weights and high moisture factors. Okay, I, I know that uh, on some of the pride corn, you're using stamina as a, as a seed trim. Have you, have you seen any impact? Um, really, uh, actually a little bit. We, we, yeah, we have stamina on our, on our fully loaded, uh, option. So for tens of maximum quattro plus stamina, um, really it's hard to know cause we don't have checks this year to tell. And it's, it seems to be on a year by year basis with those early plantings. It seems to show with that cold tolerance, but we actually have, uh, we test, uh, some pre-commercial hybrids every year and they're actually, they actually come from research and don't have stamina on them. And uh, from some of the, the qualities and traits and ratings that we've gotten from the research side, um, they should be coming out of the ground a lot quicker than they are. And they're actually a little slower than usual. So that's definitely something with the Pride team that we've chatted with the last week or so is some of those hybrids that we'd expect to see a little quicker, but they don't have stamina on them. Uh, maybe that's a factor why, why they are a little slower out of the ground. Yeah, because the stamina is supposed to add cold tolerance. Is that correct? Yeah, so essentially it's uh, it's it's the product headline. It's the same active ingredient, and it's just in on that uh, in the in a seed treatment form, and that's one of the one of the tra one of the uh, features that it's supposed to supply. Few growers were experimenting or thinking about planting a little bit deeper on their corn this year. Any any results or indication how that possibly has worked out or look or looking here in the early emerging days? Um, definitely deeper, deeper planted, uh, below two inches has, has been slow to come out of the ground. Um, but it seems that two inch mark is pretty well bang on. We need, we need to be, those, uh, nodal roots need to for sure be three quarters of an inch above the, uh, above the seed to make those brace roots. So anything shallower than that can cause an issue, but, uh, but those deeper, Deeper plantings definitely did uh, did slow things down. Actually, on some soybeans that I looked at on Monday, um, they were actually below the two inch mark for soybeans, and uh, they were a solid twenty three days coming out of the ground. Oh wow, twenty three days. Yeah. Does that surprise you? Um, a little bit. Like we, they were planted. We had a really big cold snap there about the ninth of May, where we hit negative temperatures. So that was that was the justification from the grower was planting deeper to maybe brace themselves from some of that cold. Mm. And, uh, but they are, it's a bit, bit tougher clay. It's, it's not super heavy clay, but, uh, but it's amazing that it's, it's punched its way through all that. And it's, uh, soybeans are resilient. That's, it's something every year, year in and year out, they, uh, they can show the resilience. Yeah. Cause you know, Bert, Bern was just sending a message here. What did he say? Uh, regarding soybeans. Soybeans are in the ground much earlier this year. What does that mean for yield uh, potential? Um, you know, they, they spend a lot of time on the ground, as you mentioned, but uh, do we have, I guess we won't know on yield until we get out those way wagons at the end of the year. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, well, any anytime we can, we can start making trifoliates, as many trifoliates as we can before the 21st of June, that yield potential just skyrockets. And there's always been that debate. Um, that's been this winter and, and years before on when we should be planting our soybeans and some are even saying before corn. Uh, personally, I, I still think, uh, it's the fitness factor always has to come in there and it just so happens that corn and soybeans are probably planted on the exact same day, but not everybody has that luxury. Yeah. 
Uh, good point. Yeah, some of us uh, yeah, def don't have the the equipment or the manpower to make that exactly happen. Have you seen yeah. any corn that's planted too shallow out there? Um, yeah, a little bit, and that's that's actually uh, part of uh, one of the the replants that I did see. It was about an inch and a quarter, and we did get that cold that cold snap, and I think that's definitely what affected it. Uh, it was definitely some of that cold injury. Okay, so is is growers are out there trying to evaluate their their crop establishment or stand? What are some of the things they need to be looking for? Um, definitely uh, just some evenness or. Uniformity is, is one of the big ones there. Um, yeah, we just want to see if we see too much of a variability within our stand. Uh, we may run into some issues later down the road, if, uh, especially at the pollination timing. And then that more so runs down the same thing uh, when, we're, when we're finishing out the crop too, if we've got a big variability there as well. Yeah, like we've all heard, you know, someone like Randy Dowdy talk a little bit about, you know, you want the whole entire crop to emerge on the exact same day. Um, yeah. Easier said than done, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like we don't, we don't have like even even across the field, we might not have the same soil type, and and it is it is a challenge, and that that goes right into planter maintenance as well. Is is if we have the our planter set up properly, we can really come up or uh, help out some of those issues uh, with the variability in the field, but uh, but sometimes that can affect our stand as well. Does, does that emergence, that even emergence, that you know, having that ideal uniformity, does the majority of that come down to your 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 planter setup before even hitting the field, or what would you say are some of those factors that you see continually? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so planter planting depth, um, even within within the seed trench, that seems to be one of those issues, and even other impacts, sidewall compaction, and it might not even be the planter. It's, it's, uh, it might be the operator as well. Sometimes you don't like to hear that, but, uh, waiting till those soils fit. And so, so temperature and moisture play into that as well. So if we're a little unfit, um, I've still seen this year, especially and people even say, and I agree, um, the fit soil fitness this year is even in April was, was way further than I ever was last year. But still, I, I've still seen some of those those V seed trenches still still formed from that that smearing and that sidewall compaction even in a year like this. So why is that? Um, it's just it's just we see we see too much moisture. Maybe we're we're still planting necessarily a little earlier than we potentially should, giving it those couple extra days to dry out. Um, it's it's always you only get one shot to plant and that's always uh one of those issues is if we if we try to go and we can go i do understand from the from the grower side of that as well uh, if we've got a thousand acres to plant we we might not be able to wait uh for for the ideal situation for every acre but uh but still trying to wait trying to even select hybrids as well that might uh, be able to punch through some of that tougher condition as well do, do you think that we spend enough time like evaluating that emergence? Like, are we going back in that same location or that same field and, and really kind of studying what actually happened based on our practices or our conditions for the year? Or you can only do so much? Um, I still think you can evaluate that for sure. And that, that might even impact your decisions later in the season as well. So if we, if, uh, we have those, those hatchet roots or even even issues there where our root system might not be able to grab those nutrients in the soil that we need them to. Uh, we might be able to place some late season product, either foliar or a nitrogen case, uh, instead of broadcasting, maybe going on the wide drop or we're putting that right, uh, right at the root system there where the crop can uptake it as easily as possible. Okay. Uh, Burns got a question here about strip till. So we're seeing lots of strip till happening this year. How could it benefit corn and soys in growers' areas? What, what are you seeing? Uh, I've seen seen a lot more uptake uh, lately. Um, it, it is from from a pure play nutrient placement standpoint, it uh, it's hard to beat. Um, I I I'm a huge huge advocate of trying to put the nutrients where they're going to be utilized and minimizing loss, and that seems to be a fantastic asp aspect. I think. Uh, one of those challenges with strip till, especially, and I know I know a lot of the guys who do it, they swear by it. Um, it's it's hard to convince a guy to sell your discs, sell your cultivator, and and buy the toolbar and the air cart and RTK with with 
a lot of lot of investment there. It's it's that's a challenge to to convert to that mindset. Is, is that really what's holding everybody back? Is that is taking the plunge from a capital perspective? I I think so for the most part, and, and also one of the other aspects I I have heard is, is the time. It is a challenge, especially if you get a tight year. Um, it it is very time consuming if you've got to continuously fill a cart, or or you're only doing. 20 or uh yeah 20 feet or 20 or uh, 30 feet at a time it can be a challenge and that's a lot of horsepower there as well that not every grower has hmm. it like it it seems like it fits in that category of growers that are doing it though are having a lot of success with it like i don't hear i don't hear a lot of strip till disasters right no and, no no and, and so it's sort of to me like the growers that are doing like working with strip till or it could be the same as, you know, some of the growers that are doing like relay cropping or intercropping the guy, the, the people that are doing it are seeing the benefits and they're seeing some success, but we haven't kind of hit that point of critical mass yet where we, it's, yeah. it's more common than, than, than we think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, it's, well, it's the same as seeing, well, even there's the potential within that strip till for variable rate technology, um, which we we see in other aspects on the seeding side as well, but uh, but not everybody has that set up. Um, uh, a grower with a six row finger pickup corn planter may not have that potential. They could if they went to uh, to electric drive or something like that. But uh, but the grower with the two hundred thousand dollar corn planter probably is going to see a better return on investment from that. Okay, that that makes sense. Uh, insect issues. Uh, that's <laughs> They're always uh, a pain in the the butt. Um, are we seeing anything yet, like wireworms? I uh, haven't seen a heck of a lot. Um, a very, very uh, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the uh, growers have have gone to well, uh, group twenty eight insecticide. There's not a lot of that fungicide only treatment around um, this year, so so we're not seeing damage. Uh, even the presence, especially with the cold soil, haven't seen seen a lot of uh, pressure from there especially those those below ground insects that do like those cold soils are there some insects that some of you and your agronomists are, are paying attention to watching out for though um later in the season uh, uh western mean cutworms still still on the radar um we, we saw it last year even and uh seemed the flight path and and their their timing seemed to be off from from what we typically had seen so that's always one we've got to try to keep monitoring and try to try to dial down. We do see that damage, and their their damage opens a vector for for dawn and and those ear diseases as well. Is there? I've got a question here from the newest member of Real Agriculture, Lara. She wants to ask a question. Any concerns about soybean cyst nematode in your in your area? Um. Honestly, there has there has been a little bit of bit of presence. I know Albert Tenuta does uh, does a lot of research on that topic, and uh, there has been reports in eastern Ontario, uh, not whole field infection like we do see in, in southern and southwestern Ontario, but uh, but enough that it's going to start being on the radar. Um, with uh, with selection varieties is going to be a big part of that seed treatment. There actually are a couple products on uh, on the horizon there that. Uh, most likely are going to be uh, be a key going forward, but uh, but definitely in southwestern Ontario, down in that Chatham Kent Lambton area, they they do see a lot more infection down there. We've got to be a little bit thinking about disease. I haven't heard a lot of a lot of discussions about it yet. Have you seen anything? Uh, not really on the corn and soybean front. Um, uh, on the cereal side, there's always uh, some of that that downy mildew and, and some stripe rust I've actually seen starting. Um, but, uh, but pressure's not huge. We're pretty dry here. Um, we don't have that, that, uh, extra humidity and moisture to really bring on a lot of that disease just yet. But, uh, but we're always, especially in Eastern Ontario, we're, we're pretty big, uh, pretty area for white mold and soybeans. So that's always one that's on our radar. Um, even in a year like last year where we were dry till, till Labor Day, um, it still showed up. And especially in that trying to time that aspect uh, for fungicide application and the conditions aren't there, it's really hard to justify that. Yeah, because you know, we got the heat now in Ontario, so you know, all we need is a little bit of humidity and 
haven't we kind of we got the perfect situation for to see more disease? Yeah, well, disease more more so in some of those moderate temperatures. Uh, now that we've got a lot of that heat, but uh, but definitely if we do get humidity, there'll be some things to watch there. Yeah, what uh, what kind of role does genetics play in trying to minimize that uh, that white mold pressure? Um, definitely, when we get those field tolerance varieties, we 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 try to select them as best as we can. Um, especially going forward, any new varieties we're trying to select for for good white mold pressure, we try to target any of our new products in known areas. And then, uh, so, so we need to have that good field tolerance. Row spacing plays into that as well. If we can go to wider rows, maybe drop our population. Um, but definitely selecting, selecting that plant structure, if we can get more of an upright uh, variety if we're in some of those tighter row situations, um, especially in eastern Ontario. Uh, the central part of, the, part of eastern Ontario has some larger open areas, but uh, when we get into some of those Smaller fields, lots of headlands. That seems to always run into the issue, especially a lot of a lot of former livestock operations. So some residual fertility there, and that always seems to create some of those lush canopies. Well, Margaret May of Ontario Soil and Crop says we need to get the crop out of the ground first, Sean. So she, I think she thinks I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching, Margaret. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it, but it does speak to you know we, we talked about this yesterday. When we had Jeremy Boychin here on the show is like it's so varied across the geography yeah. right we've got like out here in in the prairies we've got people that are you know they're in the middle of in-crop spraying we got people that are still trying to finish harvest from last year yeah it's uh, it, there was some overwintered corn in ontario uh, how how has it kind of worked out and stood up um, there's, there's, uh, standability is actually still pretty decent. I was actually, uh, driving around down towards the Kingston area this morning and actually saw a couple, couple fields with some corn out still. Um, I was honestly surprised. Um, actually a soybean plot I checked yesterday, the field right beside it was still corn standing. Um, it's, uh, that's always maybe a producer issue, but, but still, um, it's, yeah, it's, Standability is still there. Uh, we've had lots of opportunity to get them off the field. It's just a matter of there might be some backling uh, reasons there. M- m- much yield loss though. Like, have we seen cobs fall to the ground or like? Yeah, I yeah. There's there's definitely some break. Standability is still there, but uh, but uh, definitely cobs will be falling down, and and it's just you always you always if you leave it till till May, there's always going to be significant loss. Yeah, it's uh, it. It's, it really plays on your psyche when you don't get yeah. all that crop in the bin. Yeah. In the yeah. fall. Even even if you, you still get the yield, it, it really plays and weighs on yeah. you when you got to sit there yeah. all winter and yeah. look at the snow collect on the field. It just, yeah. it really sucks. And all that trash is still not broken down and that always just overlays into your next crop as well as you, you have all that trash to deal with that's not given the winter to break down on the ground and like microbes and insects to work at it. Here's uh, something from Darren. Uh, Darren says, wireworms typically like hard, compacted soil. Get rid of the tight soil and wireworm pressure should lessen. Thoughts on that, Neil? Oh, yeah, 100% agree. Um, especially when we get some of those clay soils, that, that typically seems to be where the wireworms like to be. Um, and then, but uh, depends on the tillage as well. If we go super deep in some of those clays, they, they might harden like a rock. So, uh it's definitely, yeah. Hmm. Okay. And like, where do you sit on the whole compaction creating yield loss? Uh, different agronomists I've talked to here throughout the spring in Ontario, some believe that, you know, compaction is one of your biggest challenges and some say, ah, maybe we kind of sort of overhype it a little bit. What do you think? Uh, I, I definitely think, uh, yeah, compaction can lead to, to yield loss and, and, there's definitely different degrees of compaction. Some some are almost irreversible, and some you can manage around. Um, I always try to look at soil as as an always evolving structure. So if you create a layer, an impermeable layer within that soil um, that nothing can really bypass, water, roots, anything, you're you're definitely impacting how productive your soil can be. Okay, before we came on the broadcast here, you mentioned to me like two weeks ago it snowed. And yeah. now, now we're like plus 30. D- does that like, does that big temperature swing have a, a positive impact on the crop? Like 
you know, it's sort of like when you're, you know, you're winter in Canada and then you go for that, you know, Mexican vacation and you get off the plane. It's like, whoa, heat. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it is nice. It is refreshing. I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, how does it impact the plant? Uh, well, thankfully, nothing was really out of the ground when we got that snow. It was kind of a flash snow squall. It was about the 12th of May. Um, and it was very isolated. Like even, uh, I was talking to a grower that we actually put a plot in the next day and I sent him a picture of the whiteout and he said, Nope, nothing here. So it's very, very, uh, very variable, but, uh, but thankfully the crop was still in the ground. So, so I think the soil very well insulated it. Even when we got that cold spell, um, I was chatting with another agronomist and he actually, kind of had the same agreement that I did. I tried to monitor as best I can. I didn't have a data logger, but uh, soil really never got below five degrees Celsius. So, so it was mm -hmm. cold, uh, not, uh, not damaging, but definitely just, it just sat idle. It just kind of sat there. It needs to be about 10 degrees for biological activity. So it just kind of sat stagnant in soil uh, with really just no, no advancement there. Hmm. Interesting. Did, th did that kind of surprise you or? A little bit, just with the fact that it did get down below minus, it was minus five um, overnight time temperature. And just, I was surprised. And definitely lighter soils may not have taken that as well. And that was, that was just on our home farm. So, yeah. so it was really hard to tell, but, uh, but it's definitely surprised that there wasn't as, a, or it wasn't a bigger swing than there actually was. Well, we know this, that, you know, we've had, we had some moisture uh, now it's hot. That means the weeds are coming. Weed control just becomes so critical early on here in the early stages of emergence. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and, and every grower's got a different strategy. Um, actually, quite a bit of spraying happened last week uh, in our area. A lot of, lot of pre-emerge and actually uh, some, some post-emerge was actually done earlier this week. So, so typically... On the corn side, a lot a lot of growers are putting a, somewhat of a residual down, um, whether it's uh, it's an atrazine plus uh, plus dual. Um, lots of different products out there. Acuron's becoming a big one uh, in eastern Ontario, but uh, but definitely uh, a lot of guys are going with that residual control uh, just to try to give them a bit of a window to to get that canopy up and get established. Yeah, well, you know, weed resistance definitely much more a part of the thought process now than it was two, five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And even, even in Eastern Ontario, flea bane is here, uh, not a hundred percent of it's, if it's glyphosate resistant yet, but, uh, but still it's there. There's more, more and more different weeds all the time. Uh, multiple modes of action is still such a great strategy. Yeah. Uh, just giving it so many different options to, to help control those. So you try to minimize that risk of resistance. Uh, where would you say we're sitting right now with the Eastern Canadian crop? We've got the, you know, we say we've got the optimal yield curve. Are we, are we still on that? Have we knocked ourselves down a little bit because of that cold weather? What do you, what do you think? Uh, well, well, especially after the year we had last year, I think, I think, uh, I think this early planting that we did get, even with the cold, um, has been, has been a huge blessing. And I think, uh, I think we're in really good shape. Uh, like crops are advancing very well. Like even uh, some late April corn that I saw yesterday is has a, has a full two leaf uh, horizontal leaves out. So that's uh, that's definitely we're on the right track there, and we're getting lots of heat. Uh, we're down supposed to be down below twenty over the weekend, but still but still lots of heat to keep that crop progressing. Crazy swings. It, oh yeah, for sure. It just, it, yeah, it, that, that doesn't change. It just seems like we just crazy swings. Like, you know, it's yeah. high of plus 10 and all of a sudden it's like, you know, we're in the thirties. Like you just talked about. Oh there. yeah. It's yeah, crazy. For sure. It's, uh, I had somebody, yeah. yeah, I had a, I had a farmer tell me the other day, he said, we, I think we just skipped spring. We went from winter straight to summer. I, yeah, I hate when we skip fall. That That's the one that, yeah. that's the one that I hate. Like, yeah. because that's also harvest. That's what we, we yeah, we've needed yeah. some good weather in the fall, but it's, it's my favorite season, but at the same time, it's also harvest time, which, uh, we need that open fall typically here. We've had so much adversity in season on, in Ontario and in Western Canada that, uh, it's when we skip fall and we go from summer to winter, that's what sucks. <laughs> that's the one that hurts. So, 
Hey, Neil, this has been a lot of fun. We've been talking to Neil McGregor of Pride Seeds. He's the market development agronomist with Pride. Neil, really, really appreciate it. Tomorrow on the show, we're going to be talking to Ted Seaford of Zanerag Hedge. We're talking markets tomorrow, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Love talking to Ted. Hey, Neil, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Just stay safe, safe, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, uh, you can tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Thanks a lot for joining us here today. I appreciate you getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Live.